Welcome to The Breakdown. I am Kurt, and I have a very special guest with me today. Can you say hello? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Can, I just, I was trying to get over the fact that you just called me very special. <laughs> you are very special. I'm I was, special, Grandma. <laughs> <laughs> if you can't tell by the sound of the voice, that is Pastor John Gagney, uh, leader of our prayer team, prophecy team here at the church, teaching at School of the Spirit, doing a host of other things, Deliverance, Freedom Center, all that good jazz. Thank you so much, first and foremost, for all that you do. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. It's really awesome. So, hey, Pastor Zach brought us right in on Sunday, um, an excellent time of worship. And I don't want to just say excellent, but it really was um, really powerful Yeah, in that time of worship just to connect with the Lord. And I've been loving how God has been doing that as we start this season. Um, and then, you know, we before we got into the message, there were several announcements, the first of which that while we're not necessarily setting up for a corporate fast, this is what we're doing. Pastor Zach did say, we are fasting. We are seeking the Lord this month as to how we should fast. And I, I know this is something that's big on your heart. Yeah. And again, I think it's one of those, what I love about it in classic HPC fashion, it's like, we're going to do this corporately <laughs> and, uh, and we really strongly encourage you to do this, but of course be spirit led and how it's that's done, it. That's it. Which is like one of our big MOs that. because I think there's times where we see in scripture where the the Lord does mandate certain types of things. Mm -hmm. Um, But of course, like most people will like live and die by like, how is that actually supposed to be done? Yes. When, when it's always clear, this underlying theme, especially through the new Testament is always like, but it's really more about the posture of your heart. Yes. (laughs) Not about how you do it. It's not about the food does not defile you. Yes. You know, it's like the things like that. So I think it's, I'd love how, um, again, of course we're approaching it this way. And pastor Zach, um, very, um, of course, like openly just says like, just do it as you feel led, but this is what we are doing. You know, we are fasting together corporately, but just be led in how that is and really turn your heart to the Lord in the season. So. A couple of key elements I think you could bring some clarity to is that, number one, I think we all personally on our leadership team believe that fasting should include some element of food. Some yeah. people might say, hey, can I just disconnect from other things? I'll have you speak to that in a moment. But also that um, an encouragement for somebody to start small who maybe has never done it before. So, Yeah, I think that's one of the things that is really important is um, with any th- discipline, you always have to usually ease yourself into it. Yes. So like, I, I, I'll i be honest with you, I haven't been to the gym in a really long time, right? And I know that I'm getting ready to start going to the gym. Um, most people on our church staff have already started, but I'm just, <laughs> my my busy, my schedule's been very busy. Uh, but I'm, I'm getting ready to start heading into the gym and I would be foolish to mm. run in there and try to pick up where I left off. Good point. Like 10 years ago. Good point. <laughs> um, it, I literally can actually damage my body wow. if I did that. And wow. you, you could end up in the hospital if you actually are not careful. Wow. Um, and so even when it comes to fasting, if you've never fasted before, so good. start out with, with one meal. Yeah. Start out with if like a Daniel fast, like I'm going to try this for three days where I'm only going to eat fruit and vegetables and, and whole grains and have no sugar and no meat and no dairy and things like that. But like start out small and, and then you build up this ability to be able to go longer, you know? And I just think it's, um, it's, it's, uh, it's a good discipline to, to add into your lifestyle, which is fasting. Um, but like, of course there's, there's no condemnation in it. The Lord knows your heart, Yeah, you know? And if you forget one day and you just like, grab something because you're rushing out the door and you totally forgot and you ate it. Don't be like, Oh my God, you're not condemned. I just ruined my fast. Like, no. Okay. So when, when it dawned on you that you did that, your, your fast can start over again that's from that it. point. So good. Like, again, it's about our heart and the Lord knows that. And that's what he's honoring is that's that so our good. desire to draw closer to him is, is what he responds to. It's so good because people misunderstand, you know, Jesus is service serving on the sermon on the Mount where he's saying, You've heard it said this, you've read this, but truly, if you're doing this in your heart, you've already committed the sin. So that goes the same true for the other side, is that it really is about the issue and the condition of the heart. So that's awesome, brother. So the other thing that Pastor Zach was sharing that um, bringing kind of to the forefront is that we're starting this year, both the elders and the leadership team are in agreement that we're starting this year with a blank canvas, Mm -hmm. which means we're not just going to come out of the gate and do all the events as a church that we have always typically done. Now, you've been here from the inception. I have not. This will be my third year coming into 
being at this church and serving. And so just wanted you to expound a little bit more on what your what your heart is behind the blank canvas and how that affects the church wide. So the blank canvas, um, it just doesn't mean we just like canceled like all of the church activities for an entire year. Yeah. Um, I it's more of um reevaluating why we do we're doing what we're doing. You know, so and good. I think that um one of the things that um, you know, because we talk about how we're Pentecostal, right? So so we're the ones that are actually free, right? Um <laughs> that, that was sarcasm. So <laughs> in case you didn't catch it in the tone of my voice. Yeah. Um so uh, what can happen is in our freedom, in our free expression to not be religious, you can become religious in your freedom. Yes. And so that actually becomes the trap that like, look at me, I'm so free and you're not. Mm. Well, they, that now you're just as you, you're now hosting a religious spirit, just as much as someone who's saying, I can't believe you're not doing this, this, and this. Why are you not taking communion every single Sunday at church? Yeah. Why, yeah. why are you not re- singing songs out of a hymnal? What do those songs not count anymore? Why are you not doing this or doing that or whatever it is? Whatever the, why, why are you wearing ripped jeans and a t-shirt while you're on stage yeah. singing on Sunday morning? Yep. And, and that mindset we, most people can say is religious because again, the Lord looks at the heart. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, there, there's something about giving the Lord your best and so, and trying to be trendy, you know, but I just, you know, <laughs> anyway, I'm not going to go down that road. So, um, just, I don't own any pants with holes in them, but, um, but anyway, but that's not for us to judge, Yes, you know? And I think at the end of the day, it's really understanding where someone's heart is and what we can do is in our freedom, we can become just as legalistic so good. in our freedom. And so what we wanted to do is we felt like the Lord pressing on the leadership to say, time out, yeah. let's pause what we've been doing all this time and reevaluate it. And it's even starts down to like, okay, should we still be doing church two services on a Sunday? Hmm. And should we still keep doing prayer on Tuesday? Yeah. And I think those for us, we feel like the Lord like mandated. Correct. It's, I mean, Sunday, of course, like is just, that's the the typical, like it works. Yep. Right. Um, but Tuesday night has been a non-negotiable from the beginning because we know the Lord has mandated this church. This church was birthed out of a Tuesday night prayer meeting. So good. And uh, we just know that in at the core of our DNA, when you strip everything back down, Tuesday night remains. Yeah, We know that. So Sunday morning and Tuesday, Tuesday night, night are the non-negotiables. Yep. But why are we doing everything we're doing? And we need to evaluate, is this what the Lord still wants us to do and to continue to do going forward? And one of the traps that the God's people consistently got into was the Lord would establish some kind of precept mm-hmm. or some kind of order. And then they, after one generation, think this, this is, is salvation. It. Yep. And so in, in Romans 9, I believe it is the second half of 9, it actually says, Paul's writing and he's like, guys, like, like this is the stumbling block of the Jew. And, and he's talking about the word of God. And he says, this is the stumbling block that they think that if they follow all of the quote unquote rules yeah. or check off the boxes of, we need to make sure we do this on this day and this on that day. And we celebrate like this and we do this, that that is salvation. And he said, and that's why the Jews are getting saved at a faster rate because they don't have any of that. They're starting with a blank slate. The Gentiles. The Gentiles, yes. I mean. They're starting with a blank slate. Yes. And so that's why they're able to receive Jesus yes. better yes. because they have a blank slate. So good. And so, and so what we want to do is say, okay, are we, we want to make sure that we, we're holding everything up to the Lord and saying, okay, all these things we've been doing, these things are great. And we know you've given us these things. Yes. Yet, yet we want to put them back on the altar and, and for a... Uh, for a visual for you guys, we want to light it all on fire. Yes. And whatever remains, yep. we'll continue to do. That's it. You know, because it could have been just a season. I know. It literally could have just been a season. And and when you when you drive through um, especially Rehoboth, there's a lot of farms, right? Yep. And uh and there's a, a bunch of farms grow corn. Like every year they're growing corn. Um, and there's this one road um through in in Rehoboth where there's this farm that is growing, they have huge cornfields. Um, and what we, I see them do every year is one area of their farm. They actually plant the little, um, like red, yellow, and orange, like sweet peppers. Okay. And so I like looked it up. This is about three years ago. I looked it up. I was like, why are they planting 
peppers instead of corn. And, um, and apparently after so many cycles, the corn has used certain stuff out in the field. Yeah. Um, and so, and, and then the field kind of becomes like almost useless to grow corn the next year. You can still do it. Yep. It just, the crop won't be as good. Yeah. So what they do is they plant these peppers and when the, and they don't even harvest them. The, the whole field is just peppers and then they, they die and they go back into the soil and it actually reinvigorates the soil. So good. So that next season for the next three years, they can plant corn in that field again and it so be what they wanted it to be. Good. And so I think that like sometimes the Lord calls us to that. And that's kind of like what the Sabbath year type thing is yes. for is you let the field rest so it can regain the nutrients so that when you go to plant again, the harvest will be plentiful again the next time. That's so. so good. And a couple of points I want to bring out here because I would say our church is an apostolic church and we're hearing from the Lord and moving and driving forward, as he says, then we as congregants, I would say, we as those who are coming in are a part of this church, we should also look and take inventory and stock on our own lives and yeah. say, okay, Lord, what have I just been doing that has just been good and gotten me to where I am? Should I mm -hmm. start? with a blank canvas as an individual, as a family, we should really bring everything. Uh, this is how, how we have to live. I would even say at this fast time, mm -hmm. we should yeah, be offering everything exactly. up to the Lord and saying, God, yep. whatever you desire. This is the perfect time to it do really it. It really is. Yeah, because, because fasting doesn't make God do something for you. No. It, it realigns us, us with, him with him. Because we, we're, we're denying something that we think our body needs to heighten our our intimacy with the father it's like no like you are my bread yes like i am am like in essence eat, eating of you i'm feasting on you yep. during this time mm -hmm. and you will actually sustain what i think my body needs you will be the one that sustains that and if you actually go in with that attitude saying lord like you know i i i i want to be closer to you i want to hear from you more and i'm telling you fasting it does help you um, hear more clearly, see more clearly, and what a better time than while you're fasting yes. to take everything and put it on the altar and say, Lord, what what is it that you have for us this year? Or maybe going forward, maybe it's the next three years or yeah. seven years or whatever. But like, in is, is this a time to reset some things in my life where I can cut out certain things, but add new things or restructure something? And now's the perfect time to do that. It really is. Well, you can already tell if you're just, you know, tuning in for the first time. This is Pastor John. I'm Kurt here. And uh, it's already so good. I want to tell you one of the reasons we got Pastor John here is because Luke is actually away in Iraq on a medical mission trip. This is so awesome. This is something that has been in Luke's heart for a while. And he's been sending me some updates on WhatsApp and just sharing with me a little bit about what's going on, how they've been packing supplies and they're getting ready to go out. He's on a two-week medical mission, so I'm loving this, and and I'll share as much as I get from him, and we'll we'll get it from Luke when he gets back. But uh, we're going to continue on and just talk a little bit about the message on Sunday. And part of the reason I asked Pastor John to come and join us is because at School of the Spirit, Pastor John teaches a course on the tabernacle. Yes, sir. The living tabernacle, which you know, you and I just sat down the other day and looked over a few things, and yeah. people are really blessed by this yeah. course. I want yeah. to tell you that. I want to thank you. I'm blessed by this course. I know. It's great. <laughs> Isn't it? That's awesome about yeah. teaching it. Yeah. And so the, the key element that Pastor Zach was bringing us to on Sunday was the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah. And I know there's so many distinct differences. Yeah. And the biggest thing I want to lean into right now that he was saying is we cannot take our cues from culture or Hollywood yeah. when approaching anything in the scripture. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was, I, I love the message, of course. I mean, he, he preached about the Ark from the position of the temple and not the tabernacle. Yeah. But the temple is just a permanent structure versus the tabernacle was movable, movable and the temple was like this crazy, huge, ornate, like mega monster, beautiful, yeah. like just, um, like offering to the Lord. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I, I loved, um, that message. Um, I thought it, I thought there was, there was actually one point of it, which was interesting that, um, I actually, um, was blessed by, and it was the part about the ark with the poles at the feet. Yeah. And I've always seen that, but like he said, you can look up like out of a thousand pictures <laughs> yeah. of the ark, you'll be lucky if you find that one that you I found. Know, I, I know. have actually not seen that picture before. Me either. And, and I've done tons of research for you this. You have. And, and you just can't find that picture that depicts that. And that's one of the things that I struggle with with teaching this class too, is that so many times 
um, all the the pictures and the things that you come across while researching are not even like biblically accurate. <laughs> so it, that's a hard thing to struggle with. And it is. and so, but this is why it's so important to know the word. Yes. And um, and and I'm telling you, like one of the things about about this class in relation to even Pastor Zach's message with taking cues from the world is that while we're going through this class, you're reading through scripture and and you're pausing and you're actually considering what it's saying. Mm. And and the students are like, I've never even seen that before. I know. I've never I've read this passage a million times and never have seen that before. And so um there's so many things and there's there's one thing that we need to know for sure. And this is one of the points I make is God does not say something for nothing. That's right. And every jot and tittle, yep. <laughs> down to every jot and tittle, there, there is a purpose for it. And when you're talking about the tabernacle or the temple and the furniture and like the ark, it is all a revelation of Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. It is all a revelation of him. And so, um, and so what we have to do as believers is be able to understand that, that as we're reading through this word, and as we're looking at something like the ark, you cannot consider culture today when you are looking at this stuff. Mm. Now, w- w- how is it relevant to culture today is an important question, but not is culture relevant to that? Yes. We have to remember that the Bible mm-hmm. has always been relevant. That's really good. The gospel good. is always relevant. Yep. We're the ones that that go out of style. <laughs> the gospel is not never out of style. It is always relevant, and I, that's what I love about this word. Actually, it's one of the reasons why I love that Pastor Zach is obsessed with the Old Testament. Yeah, because there's so much revelation. Yes, there is of Jesus Christ and how that pertains to us today, and we're so quick to dismiss it. Um, and and uh, and one of the the shocking things too is that there's a common feeling among believers, even with the students that were in, in my last semester that we just finished, um, tr- trimester. It's all right. It's all I good. I say semester. I do it's too. It's a trimester. But anyway, you get it. It's There's three in a year, but we call them <laughs> semesters. So anyway, uh, there was a common feeling of like uh, people saying, I always just viewed the God of the Old Testament as angry. Yes. Or someone that we just have to obey. Yep. But the Bible says that he is the same yesterday, today. And forever. That's it. And so if we look at the New Testament and be like, he's a God of grace. He's a God of love who's made a way for us to come into his presence. He's the same God. That's right. And he has been perpetually making a way for us to come into his presence since the first sin in the garden. I know. I agree. And so we have to look (laughs) at the fullness of scripture and say, wait, he is the same God. And I I love that song. We've been singing that song by Elevation. Oh, yeah. Same God. Oh, my gosh. I Every morning when we're trying to get ready for school and I'm like. My God, my God, I need you. Yeah. <laughs> God, I need you now. How I need you now. Yo, oh, I'm singing so the true. song because I'm like, I need you I right need now, you God. Now. Oh, God of Mary. <laughs> like, I need your favor to get out of the house on time. Um, so, <laughs> so um, no, but like he is the same God. And so we, we cannot take um, culture and try to view God in light of culture. Yes. We need to take culture and view culture in light of God. That's so true. And it's such an important part. And and that is so relevant to this, this message too. I love that you're bringing that stuff up. And even just kind of the depiction of Pastor Zach bringing us the first Hollywood image of the Ark. Yeah. And how he would reference that as almost a chest. Yeah. And I just started thinking whether we're talking about the the tabernacle pointing towards Jesus and illuminating yeah. this concept of the savior of the world, or we're looking at Jesus himself, we tend to approach religion, Christianity, whatever it is, with this question, what's in it for me? And many people are even looking at Jesus and saying, well, what's in it for me? Many people are looking at church culture and saying, what's in it for me? And we've made it all about what we can open up and what is in there for us rather than this glorious Lord who is actually making a way for us to come yeah. into his presence and to commune with him. Yeah. But it's not about yeah. what we're getting necessarily out of that. Right. It, it's actually about what he's getting. <laughs> and that really is the truth. Yeah. You know? And again, we, we get so obsessed with ourselves. Yeah. And, and that's, where the, that's where Hollywood really influences. That's where culture really influences. We are in a very, very, very selfish culture. Yeah. Our, uh, the American culture is so self-centered. 
Um, that that's why a lot of American Christians struggle even with the idea of alcohol, because our our culture is so self centered and, and focused that it's it literally is about like, well, I, I want to consume as much as I want to consume, and you can't tell me. Mm. And so it's not about just like, oh, I can have a glass of wine with my family at dinner. It's like I can go all out because I want to just go all out, and I don't need to control myself. And so we we are so self-centered and it's like, we want what we want and, and it's a democracy. So, so that means that I can get what I want and you can't tell me I can vote for who I want. Um, I can go do whatever I want to do. It's a free country. Yeah. It's a free country. You can't tell me that it's a free country. I can say whatever I want until you're not saying what everybody wants to hear you say. That's right. You know? And so like, there's this whole weird thing um, that democracy has really tainted Christianity. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, is that like, the church is not a democracy. Okay. It's a theocracy. Yeah. There is God is the one who is in charge. So like, good. And that's so it. good. That's and, it. And so when it, when it comes to, um, even, even this arc, um, and I, I love, uh, too, cause he was, you know, talking about that arc as the chest that you mentioned and how there's things in the chest yeah. and they're for us. Right. Um, and, and the real truth is that's actually partly true. But we get so focused on that part. I know. The, the truth is, is that when you look at the things that are in there, the, the, they are all revelations of Jesus. Yeah. You know, and so um, I don't know how much you want to get into to when, I, when we kind of teach about this. Um, but one, one of the things that's amazing about it is that when you start looking at what this represents and one of the amazing things about the tabernacle and even the ark and, you know, I mean, there's all these different pieces of furniture, but we'll focus on the tabernacle or the temple. Yep. And then the ark is that the tabernacle itself was a revelation of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Okay. And everything in it and everything pertaining to it is a revelation of Jesus, including the ark. Right. And so I'm going to start really big and then I'll try to narrow in on just the ark. Um, and so what happens is when we're looking at this, we see, we see this tabernacle and we see men coming to this to have an encounter with the Lord. Okay. And, and when we look at all the pieces of the tabernacle and all of the things in the tabernacle, and then we see Jesus in John chapter one show up in scripture as in, in John chapter one, it says the word became flesh and he dwelt among us. Mm -hmm. That word dwelt in the Greek is actually translated in the Hebrew uh, as tented. Nice. The the word in the Greek is skeinoo, I think it is. And, and, uh, and it actually means tented. And one of the, the main words or understandings of the tabernacle is it was a tent. Mm -hmm. The tent of meeting was actually literally a tent. Yeah. And there was two tent of meeting. There was the actual tabernacle sanctuary. And then there was one that Moses would go out and he would pitch a tent and meet with God there. Yeah. And then we start looking through the old Testament, all of the fathers of this faith would actually go and they would tent with the Lord in the wilderness. And then the Bible says Jesus came and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that word dwelt literally is translated as tented. He came and tented among us. So he, he became the tabernacle in the flesh. Yes. Right. And then what does it say? It says, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Or John says he was the light of the world. Yeah. Yeah. But then we look just a few chapters later, like in, even in Matthew, uh, Matthew five, and Jesus says of us, you yeah. are the light of the world. Yep. And so, and then when we see in first Corinthians, Paul says, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yes. And so what happens is there's this transference Mm -hmm. of how all this time, everything's been pointing to Jesus. And then Jesus shows up and he's the tent. He's the tabernacle. He's the light. He's the bread. He's the priest. He's all these things. And then when Jesus, uh, Jesus himself, and then after Jesus ascends and the Holy Spirit comes, all of a sudden, we're the tent. We're the, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. So good. We're the light. We're, we're the, the reflection of Jesus. So therefore, when, when people are sharing of the bread of life that we have, 
they are partaking of Jesus. So good. So now when you look at the ark and you look at the things in the ark, we look at the 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 testimony, the tablets of testimony, which is the the Ten Commandments. Yep. The manna and the staff, Aaron's budded uh, almond staff, right? And we look at those things and we think about how they're for us. Mm. But really, they all represent Jesus. Yeah. Mom, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Like, who is, what is the word? He is the word. So, right? And then when you look at the manna, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And if you eat of me, if you partake of this, Mm -hmm. then you will be a part of me. And then now that that bread of life is in us and the word is in us, which the word is also the bread of life. And he is the word. And then the staff, Jesus is our one and final high priest for all time in the order of Melchizedek. And then it says, Peter, you are all a royal priesthood. Yes. A holy nation. So yes, those things represent who we are, but they're promises that are rooted in Jesus Christ. And when you look at the ark, and you see those things in there, this vessel carrying, this, this is, these are the promises that the Lord has. Yeah. The, these are his promises to, to represent what he desires to pour out on all mankind, which is these things. And like the manna always represented God's promises that he will provide, but it also was foreshadowing of this is the bread of life. Mm. Like Jesus will be the one who sustains you, which is back to the fast. So good. He is our bread of life like our daily bread, mm-hmm. not just reading our Bible, That's right. but, but also listening to him. Yeah. He is still speaking. Yeah. And so like partaking of that daily bread that the Lord will always provide that. And so we look at these things and they're in this vessel that's being carried. And, and when I teach this I, the, toward the end, I'm saying like, you, you are the ark. Yeah. And those things are in you. Wow. As much as they are for you, in you wow. for the world. How are you carrying the ark? That's good. And oh, so, yeah. So like, are you carrying it in a worthy manner? Meaning, are you living a life worthy mm. of what Jesus came for? Mm. That's so good. God's promises for this earth is that he is our high priest and he is our in- intercessor, but that we are also royal priests and he has sent us as ambassadors to this earth to this earth yeah. to to come to advance his kingdom through us and then the word is in us and we are partaking of that but it's not just for us we are supposed to be pouring that out yeah like a non-believer should be able to come and partake of the the bread of life that's it by having a conversation with us yes and and the the 10 commandments the law of the lord it's not just the 10 commandments like do do this don't do this when you read the 10 commandments it literally is Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Yep. This this is what Jesus said. That's it. This is the, the number one commandment, which basically he summarized those 10. That's it. And and are we doing that? Yeah. Because that is us loving the Lord and loving others, which has nothing to do with us. That's right. But are you carrying that in a worthy manner? Which what Pastor Zach's point yeah. was, carrying the ark is the ark being carried in a worthy manner. Yeah. But are you carrying yourself mm-hmm. as the ark in a worthy manner as well? That is so good. That's it's like that's really powerful. I mean, I'm sitting here seeing why people love this course. <laughs> and I just want to kind of point out that this course will run again in the next trimester it's in spring, spring. Spring 2023. In the morning. <laughs> and we'll, I know it's gonna be great. Yeah. That's so powerful. Yeah. You know, I I I I just want to highlight you said two things that it, it's partly true that that what is inside there, the the testimony, the manna, the authority, yeah. those are for us, but they are also what we're carrying for the world. Absolutely. That is so good. Yeah. That's really, really good because the whole thing is that this ark was to be carried. It was resting on the shoulders and the hands mm-hmm. of these Levites and priests who were bringing it. So now we, as the carriers of the presence of God, have those same things that we're yeah. bringing with us. and But we become the ark and his presence is, is on us. Yes. His presence is on us. And when we look at that, it talked about how it's a throne. Yeah. Right? And that's one of the things I talk about. It's called the mercy seat, the actual cover. Yeah. So that's one of the things that's interesting about this. And he didn't really get into this is yeah. that the actual ark the, is the box, mm-hmm. the container that held these things. But the, the, the top, the cover for it, where the cherubim were and the presence was, actually had a different name it was actually called the mercy seat yeah and i say 
that is the throne of God. That's it. And he is sitting on that throne between the cherubim. And when you look at like Revelation and you see Jesus, the Lamb of God, sitting on the throne and the angels around him yep. or the elders around him and they're worshiping him and the presence is there. And so this is this the, the tabernacle or the temple is a blueprint of what is in heaven. Mm-hmm. It's what is in heaven. Yep. And so it's a blueprint of what is established in heaven. And so you the the presence resting on the mercy seat. Mm. And and what when you think about that, when we think about the throne of God, what's one of the first pictures we get? Judgment. But he calls it yeah, I know. the mercy seat. Yeah. And do you want to know the other name for it? What? Once a year, it's actually referred to as the atonement cover. Yeah. Because once a year, the high priest would sprinkle blood on it and atone for the sins of the nation. Wow. And so the mercy seat and the atonement cover was the place that God is judging from, but it's covered in the blood of Jesus. <laughs> and 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 it's actually referred to as mercy. Yeah. This is actually wow. God's mercy. Yes. And we think about it judgment I as know. a bad thing. I know. He, and mercy is something that we don't deserve, but that the Lord actually will dish out mercy for us for, for one reason, which is to bring us back to him. Yeah. And so you going through a hard time right now, you going through financial hardship, you feel like you're in a wilderness season, you just lost your job, you just lost your mom, all these different things are going on and you feel like everything's coming against you. This is the mercy of God. Mm. Why? Because he's allowing these things to come through to bring us back to him. Wow. And, and, and perpetually, since the first sin in the garden, the Lord has been making a way for us to come into his presence. Why? Because his heart's desire is that his creation is redeemed back to him. Yes. So that he could be in their presence. Yep. More than we want to be in his I presence, know. he wants so to be good. in our presence. And when we look at that, we look at that story of Adam and Eve, and let's think about the ark, the mercy seat, the throne where he wants to judge from, where his presence resides, and think about it as atonement, which is the shedding of Jesus Christ's blood for our sin and for our healing, okay? We look at that, and they had to sacrifice an animal to pour that blood out to cover the sins. Yeah. And by the way, just in one note in here, um, the blood of Jesus does not cover your sin. It removes it. Yes, Okay. that's right. So the, that's old, so good. the old Testament, yes. it was just covered. Yep. But under the new covenant, it's removed. It's good, and man. And Moses actually prophesies that. <laughs> Multiple places they prophesy <laughs> that. Okay. This is why but, you're here today. Yep. This is awesome. And so, and so when we look at Adam and Eve, right? They're in the garden. And, and Eve succumbs to the temptation of the serpent. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then Adam also now sins. And, and the next morning, God walks back into the garden. And they're hiding. And God says, where did you guys go? Like he didn't know where they were already, right? But he yeah. says, where did you go? And they're like, we're, we're naked. So they're hiding in shame. Yeah. And he said, who told you you were naked? And what does he do? He sacrifices an animal. He sheds the blood of the animal and then covers them in the skin of that animal. Yeah. Why? To hide, to cover their shame. For what purpose? So that they would come out of hiding and into his presence. Mm. And so the Lord in that first moment after the first sin shed blood to cover their sins. So good. So that they did not feel ashamed so that they would come out of hiding. Why? Because the Lord longed to be in their presence. Yes. He wanted to commune with them, yeah. but shame was keeping them from him. And so the Lord is perpetually doing this. That's why it says boldly come before the throne. Yep. It doesn't say get all your crap right yep. and repent and then you can come before no. the throne. It says boldly come before the throne. So in our mess, yep. we have this really weird confidence yeah. that I'm going to come before the throne. Why? <laughs> because the Lord is saying, don't let shame stop you Yes. because you think you're going to be judged here, but my mercy and the so atoning good. blood of Jesus is actually beckoning you to come into my presence and you can, the veil has been torn. Yeah. So now you can actually boldly come before my throne. And when you get there, don't let anything hold you back. Yep. Because when you get there, then I'll say, I love you so much. Let's clean this up a little bit. Yeah. So <laughs> and, good. But instead we do the opposite and we actually 
allow ourselves to be isolated and hold ourselves back from coming in. But this is like the whole thing. And when you get there, you see how holy he yep. is. You experience how holy is he is. And the Holy Spirit goes, hey, listen, son, daughter, you have this thing that we need to take care of because what it keeps doing is it's actually not allowing your father to be able to come into your presence because he is holy, yeah. but he wants He you. wants to. He yes. wants to be in your presence. So if you want more of him, you can start taking care of some of the stuff and stop doing these things. Carry, and then you can carry my presence in a more worthy manner and experience me at a greater level. And and but this is what we want. This is and that's why I love. Oh my gosh, that that um throne room song that yeah. that Pastor Zach and Ashley wrote. My favorite line is that the longing of his heart is satisfied. I know that's what it is. He longs for us to come into his presence more than we want to be in his presence. And so he has provided this way, like he established this tabernacle, this temple, this ark yeah. so that we could experience his presence. But then Jesus became that. That's it. And then now we are that and he is in us and we are in him and he is in us and we are in him and he is in us. And it's this perpetual, just growing in the intimacy and the closeness in that. And the more we continue to press in, the more that atonement cover begins to become real to us, the more he, the mercy seat of God becomes a real place where we can come and meet with him and say, I, I know you've got me through this trial right now. I'm not asking you to take me out of it. I'm asking you to give me everything I need to succeed to get through it because I see that there's something else you're trying to accomplish here. Mm. This is so good, Pastor yeah. John. As you're talking, I mean, I know we're way over time here, but as you're talking, a couple of things are firing off at me. And it's like, you just brought to completion a better understanding of Esther. She comes to that place yep. boldly. And what does she find? She finds mercy. Yep. You brought to completion Isaiah before the throne. And what happens? It's God who's made a way for him to get there in the spirit. And then it's God who's made a way for him to be cleansed yep. in his presence. You, this this whole concept that it's God that desires to be in our presence and has made a way by covenant and all these different things throughout the history for us to come. That's really powerful. Yeah, so good. We need to go back and kind of just rewind this whole thing. So please <laughs> listen again. It's so good. So good. Hey, man, thank you so much yeah, for dude. joining us today. I want to encourage everybody. Again, Wednesday mornings, it'll start in the spring. So we kick off the March trimester in March, latter, latter part of March. And you can get, our, get on our website to register today. But this is so good, so powerful. I knew that you were supposed to join us yeah, today for this. Yeah, man, I appreciate it. No problem. I, I love it. <laughs> it's powerful. Well, listen, thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back next week with another special guest. And as always, I'm Kurt, and I've got Pastor John here. Go ahead and do it. I'm Kurt. All right, and I'm John. <laughs> <laughs> and that's The Breakdown. We'll catch you next week.